And welcome to ETF Edge, CNBC's newest show dedicated solely to the three and a half trillion dollar ETF market. I'm your host, Bob Pisani. Each week, we will break down the biggest trends and help you build the best portfolio in the world using ETFs. Today, we're joined by Dave Nodick. He's the managing director of ETF.com. And Doug Jonas, he's the head of exchange traded products right here at the New York Stock Exchange. Let's get started today with the biggest mover, and that's biotech. Check out the IBB and the XBI biotech ETFs, both of them up as deal talk in this space has been heating up today. These are the two largest biotech ETFs, but they are actually very different. Let's look under the hood at what's inside these ETFs. Now, the IBB is a weighted, market cap weighted ETF and includes names like Biogen, Gilead, Celgene, and Amgen, just to name a few. The top 10 holdings there make up more than 50% of that ETF. On the other side is the XBI, which is an equal weighted ETF, all equal weighted. It includes names like Celgene, AbbVie, and Insight. The top 10 holdings, they're only 15% of that ETF. Doug, uh, let me talk a little bit, uh, Dave, let me talk a little bit with you about this. The important thing here is they're not the same. Market cap weighted and uh, uh, individually weighted or uh, separately weighted is a completely different animal. Yeah. How do you choose between one versus the other? Well, really, I think it's a question of whether you're looking for broad-based long-term exposure. If you're trying to catch sort of a particular earnings season, I think the equal-weighted strategy here, the uh, XBI, the S&P, uh, Spider S&P Biotech, uh, gives you that broad exposure. It's actually a little bit cheaper, uh, so you're kind of getting a double whammy here. Most of the time, these equal-weighted strategies tend to be more expensive. In this case, you're getting that equal-weighting, that quarterly rebalancing, and you're getting it at a cheaper price. I think the important thing, though, Doug, is you there are certain limitations to the way these are constructed it's just not market cap uh, versus uh, individually weighted it's it's the way the, the index is constructed yeah, as well that's right it's full investment construction that's different across products so when we look at XBI that's going to take in the entire marketplace of uh, biotech and pharma whereas uh, when we look at the iShares products, the iShares ETF really limits it to just one exchange. So if it's only NASDAQ listed names, so you start to, to remove some of the largest pharma and biotech companies out there. Example would be Takeda. Takeda is listed here at the yep. New York Stock Exchange. 30 billion in market cap wouldn't even be considered in the iShares ETF. And yep. yet I, I, Dave, have a certain appeal. I see a certain appeal to equal weighted because it's essentially an investment strategy. We've talked about this many times. With an equal weight, after a certain period of time, say every quarter, you're essentially going to sell your winners and you're going to buy some of the losers. So you're essentially reweighting all of the time. Is is there something to be said for that kind of strategy? I think for long-term investors, the proof is in the pudding. Equal weighted strategies over full market cycles, up and down, tend to outperform precisely for what you're saying. They tend to reinvest in those value stocks that may be oversold sold at a, little, at a point in time and to sell some of those momentum stocks that maybe get a little pricey in an upswing. So what should you do? If you're a long-term investor, Doug, do you, do you choose one over the other? I have seen in my 23 years covering the markets, I have seen big cap names that are in, for example, the, the, the uh, market cap weighted index outperform dramatically and smaller names fall by the wayside. And then we've seen some short periods where people try to buy the big cap of the smaller cap names. How do you decide what's the best investment strategy for Yeah, you? I think Dave's point of full market cycles is really what it comes down to. Whenever you go away from a market cap weighting, you're effectively taking a bet. Yeah. You're, you're, you're making a factor bet is what we would call it. And that factor takes, in many t cases, a long period of time to expose itself. So investors, unfortunately, tend not to go through an entire market cycle. And then what they en we end up finding is when that factor is out of performance, they tend to sell. When it's in performance, they buy. And so what we've really seen is that market cap weighting in many cases, even though maybe you're overexposed to one name in your opinion, you, there is a reason that name is, is rising. And there's a reason the, the laggards are falling. And so effectively, you're keeping in line with the overall marketplace. Uh, let's just move on here. Let's shift gears a little bit because one stock that's caught investors off guard is Apple. Now, this tech giant is down nearly 40% from its October highs, and the chances are you felt the hit if you're an investor. Believe it or not, Apple currently sits in more than 600 ETFs. That's why it's so important to know what you own, one of the themes of this show. Check out some of the ETFs with the most exposure to the stock. The XLK Tech Sector ETF, that's the biggest one. Vanguard VGT ETF, Fidelity FTEC ETF, that's just a few of the bigger ones. So if you're looking to get into tech, but don't want to be tied to one particular name, what should you do? 
So again, let's play a name, a game. We're gonna call this, buy this, not that. Okay, Dave, so you're, obviously, if you're market cap weighted and you're in either a broad S&P uh, index or you're in a big tech index, you're gonna own a lot of Apple. Kind of Apple Three, right. four, five percent. Again, let's talk about other alternatives, equal weighted alternatives, for example. You don't have to have something that Apple is the big monster in every single yeah, ETF you own. Absolutely. The Invesco S&P 500 Equal Weighted Tech ETF, which is symbol RYT, is a clear alternative here. It's a little more expensive at 40 basis points, but its exposure to each individual name is only about 1.5%. That puts your Apple exposure inside RYT half of the exposure you'd have just in the S&P 500. Currently, Apple sitting at about 3.5% of the S&P. Yeah, so you have 1.3% in this RYT. Right. And what, what are we in the uh, the main uh, so in, technology? In, uh, is it 13%? you're looking at 16.5%. 16%. So That's exposure. a huge difference. Yeah. Okay. And Doug, you have pointed out to me many times that there are some advantages sometimes to having actively management. Now, active management is a pretty small group of the ETF sector, but, but it's growing. Can you make some argument here that if I want to own Apple but not so much, maybe active management is a good way? Yeah, small but growing. I mean, a lot, one of the misconceptions about ETFs is that they're all index-based, and that's not the case. If you look at last year, 23% of the ETFs launched were all actively managed. And just like an actively managed fund, you have a portfolio manager that's picking securities. You know, there's a couple of technology ETFs that have been doing very well, actually beating the S&P 500 over the last year. You have the ARK Innovation ETF, ARKK, ARK Web X.0 ETF, ARKW, both of which performing in the technology sector where a portfolio manager is going to choose. Do they want to own Apple or do they not want to own Apple? It doesn't have to be a own it all because you've chosen an ETF. Your thoughts on active management? Yeah, I mean, I think those are great funds. Kathy Wood, the portfolio manager there, has just absolutely hit it out of the park for the last year or two. You know, making the choice not to be 16, 17, 18 percent in Apple, looking at smaller, more innovative companies. I think you got a point. And yet, as time goes on, we saw Apple's down, what, 40 percent from its high. These tend to self-correct. There is an argument for made but there, there's a reason you want to own the biggest companies that are out there because they have the most influence on these sectors. It's certainly not good when it's on the downside, but we love it when it's on the upside. I didn't sure. get anybody complaining Nobody to complains me about up. XLK and yeah. technology when Apple was, you know, up on the year dramatically. There's a reason market cap weighting strategies are the biggest yeah. names in the business. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, and then they, they tend to get the majority cash flows, a little bit straightforward. They tend to match with one another when you're doing building blocks in an overall right. portfolio. And they tend okay. to be cheaper, too. That's right. Let's end with a little myth busting because there are a lot of misconceptions out there about ETFs. One being that ETFs cause volatility. Some active managers are warning that the move towards passive investing in ETFs could pose a risk to the markets should ETF investors suddenly start to sell. But are they really a threat to the market, Doug? You've had to deal with this question for a long time. We've heard this come out for over 25 years now. We've yet to see any problems with dislocation as a result of ETFs. We've had large volatility events. The last month has been historic yeah. volumes here on the floor. One of the, the misperceptions they say is, oh, well, if an ETF is trading, somehow that trade impacts the underlying security. But we just don't see it. The math doesn't prove it. Less than 10% of the ETF trades actually result in any kind of creation redemption activity where someone had to go and buy and sell the underlying security. Yeah, what's amazing to me is we see all the people say, wait till things get volatile, then you're going to see the whole yeah. ETF lie exposed. How much more volatile can we be well, in the last three months? And the ETF market and the, the overall market generally has functioned under a lot of pressure and function fairly well. Well, and this idea that somehow ETFs are going to be the seller that drive things is exactly the opposite of what we've seen. You look over the last six, seven months, we've seen huge outflows from actively managed equity mutual funds and all that money plowing into equity ETFs. ETF buyers have been the floor on this market, not the ceiling. Yeah. We want to move on here. One of the things we're going to show you over the next few weeks is model ETF portfolios. We're not wedded to one. We're, I'm not wedded to any of them. I just want to give you all a sense of how you could build a low-cost ETF. And I'm talking ultra-low cost, so we turn to you for some advice on how to do this. And you set up one for us. It's got one, two, three, four, five, six ETFs in it, and it's pretty well diversified. U.S. equities, you want to use that iShares core S&P 500 symbols, ITOT. You've got a 40% weighting in that. Now, we can argue about the weighting. Sure. But the point is, 
what is this, four basis points? So it's five basis points all in for this whole portfolio. Five ITOT, that iShares fund, that's sort of your equity anchor, is only three basis points. This is frankly the lowest cost portfolio of any kind you can put together. You can't put together a mutual fund portfolio, a separately managed account portfolio. You cannot beat it on cost. And you, of course you have international exposure here. You have the world X the US, that's the spider S&P world. GWL is a the symbol there, 30%. Again, we can quibble about the, the, the percentages here. Emerging markets, SPEM. Now, there are many emerging market ETFs, EEM included, but this is probably the lowest cost one. 11 basis points. 11 to basis point. Okay. Uh, bonds, aggregate bond index, that's the Schwab one you're using. Again, low cost. Yep. There's other ones that are out there. There's AGG too. Yeah, but, but it's hard to beat four basis points for, you know, yep. that kind of broad bond exposure, equity, you know, in corporates, uh, right. treasuries, you name it. Now, I was intrigued that you gave 5% each to two smaller asset classes, real estate and commodities. You, you have uh, Schwab US REIT here, which obviously owns real estate investment trust in the United States, uh, and Granite Shares Commodity, which owns a broad basket of commodity futures there, 5% weighting each of those. Yeah, absolutely. I think most investors are underweight these alternative asset classes, if we want right. to call them that way. Um, they're super cheap in an ETF wrapper. They do exactly what they say on the tin. Doug, your yeah, thoughts? I, I think it's interesting that someone who's followed this portfolio for a lot of years, seeing the diversity of names, it's really not just the big three players that are in this space. Charles Schwab ETFs brought in over $28 billion in net cash flow last year, and, and that's been 2018's story. We had 58 different issuers launch ETFs last year, 16 of which brand new to the industry. So it's about diversity and growth for the industry. Well, the important thing is this isn't the last one or the first one. We're going to have many more of these model ETFs to show you how you can build a low-cost ETF portfolio. That does it for this week's ETF Edge. I'm Bob Pisani. My thanks to Dave and to Doug for joining us today, and thank you for watching. You can find all of our latest videos right here on our website. That's etfedge.cnbc.com. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at ETFEdgeCNBC. We'll see you next Monday, same time, same place. Have a good week.